Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves. The Earth Shaker Tour featuring Building 429 with Colton Dixon and Finding Favor. The Earth Shaker Tour. What's up, Pottersville, New York? I'm Jason from Building 429. And I'm Colton Dixon. And we can't wait to be out on the road with Finding Favor at the Jack Weirdson Center on November 3rd on the Earth Shaker Tour. We're honored to be partnering with World Vision to make this tour more than just a show, but an experience to see what it means to be unashamed and to be an Earthshaker wherever you may be. For tickets and more info, go to www.earthshakertour.com. Excited to see you there. Well, hey, good morning, guys. Um, just a quick announcement uh, pertaining that Earthshaker tour. Tickets will be sold for $15 at lunch today. So if you want to uh, take part in that, you got to get your tickets today or some other time. But they will be sold at lunch today for $15. So with that, would you guys please stand as we sing? So 
worship you this morning. We thank you, O oh God. You are high and lifted up and worthy of all of our praise. And yet you, you are here with us this morning, and we, we are never out of your presence. And we thank you, God, that you have promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, help us to be aware of your presence with us this morning as we worship you, as we come before you uh, to open your word. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be um, receptive to what you have for us. And uh, again, that these words that we've sung would not just be mouthed by us, but that they would reflect the, the, the reality of our hearts, oh God, that we love you, we adore you, we worship you, and we look forward to that day when we will be in your very presence in heaven. And we thank you that all that is possible because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We thank you, we praise you, and we ask your blessing on this time in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Chancellor's Chapel. Always a good time to uh, be together, and uh, I want to just mention to you, hopefully many of you are already doing this, but let's be in prayer for the Live For More tour that's out on the road right now, and a number of students out on the road with Dick Dre and company. They are in the states of Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio, and so um, let's keep them in prayer this week as they are uh, visiting a lot of schools and um, ministering in a number of churches as well. So uh, we are privileged this morning to uh, have Dr. Jeremy Kimball with us. Uh, no stranger to second-year students, but for first-year students, Dr. Kimball uh, hails from Cedarville University, and this is his third year to teach in the second-year program. The first year he was here, he taught actually on the subject of leadership, and then last year and this year, taking 2 Corinthians, and he's going to be opening the word to us in just a moment, and uh, we're looking forward to that. But before he comes, uh, just to take a look at the screen and uh, just a quick piece about Cedarville University. And I just want to put a little shout out for both the schools that are represented here this week. Appalachian Bible College, yay. Cedarville University, yay. Two great schools. And you ought to be considering the possibility that God would be leading you to one of these. So enjoy this short little uh, uh, video about Cedarville. And then right after, Dr. Kimball's going to come up and share uh, this morning. I chose Cedarville because I had heard so many great things about it and my roommate at the time was actually, uh, had lived in Cedarville her whole life and she just continually told me about how the students there lived out Christ-like lives. I chose Cedarville because uh, I had three older siblings come here um, and it just was a beautiful atmosphere that I wanted to be a part of. They are committed to excellence. Uh, it's everywhere. The excellence of the buildings here, uh, the excellence of the, the professors that are here, they want you to succeed. まあ、まずはじめにシダビルは本当にレベルの高い大学だということです。ここではコクリティ大学と同じぐらいのレベルの教育を受けられましたして、シダビルはクリスチャンの全て、え、基礎教に原点を置いた教育を受けることができます。And that's why I chose Cedarville. The teachers are honestly so amazing and they're really involved in your life and they care about you succeeding and they care about your grades and it's rigorous, but it's all worth it. They are rigorous, and they uh, allow you to apply the work that you're doing and really get to, to test you to see what talents you have. When I graduated from Word of Life Bible Institute, I had no idea that I would end up at Cedarville University. When I was at Word of Life, we spent time with Jack, with Harry. We walked around the campus in New York. It was incredible. And then to be able to take all of that information, all that training, all of that discipleship, and be able to use it here at Cedarville has been incredible. Word of Life Canada was instrumental in my life. That was one year that I'll never forget. They taught me that God's Word is, is everything. And here, uh, I get a chance to be the guy to show the other guys in the dorm, hey, ministry is important no matter what you're doing, no matter what major you have. Ministry's got to be a part of that. Cedarville is a very warm and welcoming community. Um, I get to plug in with churches, uh, classes and dorm. What I've really enjoyed is, is the dorms. Uh, being with, with the guys in Brock, really getting to know people one-on-one uh, -on -one and, and just hanging out with the guys. Uh, they're really friendly. I'm Canadian and they're American and that's not, it's not uh, hindering anything. 
definitely uh, built some fantastic relationships with students. So if you want to live and grow in Christian community where you get to apply what you learn in Word of Life, Cedarville is a great place. That's all that you could ask for, honestly, um, is building a relationship with Christ while you're at Word of Life and then going to another university and studying your major that you choose um, while learning about Christ again. Like that was, that was awesome to me to hear. So that's why I chose Cedarville. Good morning, guys. Good to see you. So, if you have Bibles, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 1 this morning. Hebrews chapter 1. This is why I love this. This is why I love this school. Um, I would love to talk to you about Cedarville. If you want to find out more details, I'd love to talk to you at lunch or at dinner sometime if you want to connect about that or anything else. I'd love to just talk to you about the details of what we do there and uh, love, love teaching at Cedarville. It's a great place to be. So, um, but I want to take time here to get into God's word. So let me pray before we get started and uh, ask God's blessing this time. Father, God, as we open your word, I pray that it would accomplish all that you desire it to. We bask in the promise that your word will not return void, that it will accomplish all that you set out for it to, desire, to, to accomplish. And so, God, I pray for our lives this morning. I pray that you would impact and have direct effect on us as we behold your glory in Christ. I pray, God, that you would shape our character and shape our affections and our actions to be Christ-centered. Would you, in this moment, free us Take that step in freeing us from the bondage of sin for the sacrifices of love. Would you use this time to accomplish that as a step in that direction, God? We want to be a people that are repenting from sin and turning towards you and are ready to lay down our lives, if need be, for the sacrifices of love that we have for you and for others. We want to impact nations and peoples across the world. And the only impact that will come is through Jesus Christ. So God, I pray for this faculty and administration and staff and students that are here, that you would compel us with the truth of Jesus Christ, that we would spread a passion for his name in all things. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about looking looking to Jesus specifically and seeing his glory. So this past summer, my family, my wife Rachel, and my daughter Hannah, son Jonathan, got to go to Estes Park, Colorado. If you've ever been there before, I don't know if you have or not, but we love the Rocky Mountains. We love hiking as a family. I said you know, a couple of years ago, my, my kids are learning to love to hike. <laughs> They're still pretty young, but we hiked a lot of miles while we were there. And there was this constant refrain in our mouths to our kids as we drove places and hiked places, and it was this, look, <laughs> take a look, see that, go look at that. There's elk over there, there's snow-capped mountains over there, there's this massive vista of the Moraine Valley over here. We kept saying to them, just look and see the beauty in front of you. There's not even technology in front of our kids' faces. We don't do phones or tablets with our kids. There's just coloring pages or whatever else, so we're just like, okay, away from that, that's great, but look out there, see that. And we, we do that for a couple of reasons. We believe that as parents, we're trying to think of valuing beauty because we can miss what's right in front of us sometimes. We're, we're buried here in a screen and missing this. And then secondly, we, we believe that beholding beauty can transform who we are what we value, how we think and live in the world. And God gave us beauty in creation to behold. The heavens declare the glory of God. We see him there, but he's given us even more specific beauty to gaze at and be transformed by. And if you're in my second year class, you hear this again, I'm sorry. Repeat here. But 2 Corinthians 3.18, you've heard it yesterday and today as well. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed 
into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. You become like what you behold, that verse is telling us. If you behold the glory of God in the face of Christ, you increasingly become conformed to that image. That is what we want, is it not? We, we desire a further conformity into Christ's image. That's the, the meaning of our lives. We be conformed to his image. And the Bible is full of the display of his glory from beginning to end. The Bible is a story of God's glory in Christ. So we can say with 1 Peter 1.8, though we haven't seen Jesus with physical eyes, right? Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you have not now see him, seen him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. May that be our hearts, brothers and sisters. And if that's not what we are today, may we, may we pray for that heart to be true of us. So the pathway to Christ-centered transformation is, is a fight. It's a fight to see truly and then to savor the beauty of Jesus Christ. So this, this main point, which I want to get across to you guys today in, in the limited time we have here, is this. Spending your life's energies and capacities, seeing, savoring, and spreading a passion for Jesus Christ will result in persevering assurance, joy, and obedience. That's a long sentence, I know. But this is Hebrews 1, 1 to 4 especially, and then more in the book as a whole. Just enjoy reading Hebrews. It's such a good book. Spending your life's energies and capacities, seeing, savoring, and spreading a passion for Jesus is not a wasted life. This is life. This will result in persevering assurance, joy, and obedience. We can go anywhere in the Bible virtually and see the glory of God displayed so I want to just take one passage, just choose one here, Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4, and, and contemplate several glories of Christ. And my prayer for us is that we would see Christ, savor the beauty of who he is, and be transformed as a result. Hebrews 1, verse 1 says this, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So much here. I just want to unpack, again, several glories we see of Christ in this passage. First we see in verses 1 and 2, God has spoken to us in his Son. God has spoken to us in his Son. So all throughout the Old Testament, God speaks through prophets, whether it's Moses or Elijah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, God is speaking through his prophets. And these prophets spoke of many realities, but all were pointing in some way toward a coming figure, a king of Israel from the line of Abraham and Judah and David, who would definitively and decisively crush the head of the serpent. There's a coming one that they were anticipating and awaiting, and their promises and prophecies pointing forward to this messianic figure. And then Jesus of Nazareth comes onto the scene. In the Gospels, we read this account of who he is. We see biographical detail and commentary in the New Testament regarding the person and work of Jesus. The Messiah sent by God to fulfill all these Old Testament promises and prophecies there. So what God has spoken in and about the Son is continuous with Old Testament, again, promises and prophecies. And so God has spoken now specifically in and through His Son. Praise God this morning that God is there and He is not silent. He's spoken to you. 
He wants to meet with you and say things to you. It's in a book called the Bible. He is there to speak his word to you. When the Bible speaks, brothers and sisters, God speaks. So treasure your Bibles and see Christ there. Second, Jesus is the heir of all things. Verse 2. The Father appointed him as the heir of all things. The Father has made the Son the inheritor of the universe. Read Psalm 2 about this. He is one who inherits these things. Daniel 7 as well mentions this. Jesus lived a perfect life, died as a substitute and a sacrifice on our behalf so that we might have our sins covered and receive forgiveness through faith in him. This is the gospel news that we love. He rose from the grave. He ascended to the place of authority. And so he's, he's in this place already of authority. But there's a day coming, Philippians 2 says, right, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess someday when he returns that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's coming. Someday when he returns, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him. Th this is just a point to raise on application here. Just, Jesus will have in subjection to him all that is. New heavens, new earth, that whole idea there. So when you read your Bibles, what, what does it mean to listen to a person who in the end will have, and even now in his sovereignty, will have under his complete control and ownership all things? What does it mean to listen to this guy, Jesus? All things. All land, all water, all fire, all wind, all energy, all natural resources, all nations, all military might, all bacteria and viruses, all angels, all demons, all peoples. What does that mean? It means quite simply, you can trust him in the good and the bad of your life. It means that when he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, that he will make good on that promise because he will own all things. When he says nothing in all creation will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, he will make good on that promise. When he says there'll be no longer death or mourning or crying or pain, we can say, yes, I trust that because he will be the sovereign over all, making good on all of his promises. You can trust him today and tomorrow and in five years, and in ten years, and if we linger, 40, 50, 60 years down the line. You can trust him. Next, he made the world. Verse 2, he made the world. So through whom, through Jesus, the Father created the world. So Colossians 1, John 1 says this as well, through him all things were made. So, to state the obvious. To create something from nothing. Genesis 1, realities. God said, let there be light, let there be this, that, etc. And it was, is astounding. We, we create things, put in quotes, we create things all the time. Right, so I've got a, I've got a buddy who's an engineer at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton. And he, you know, works on jet propulsion components. That's what he does with his life. He enjoys that as an engineer. My, my daughter loves to draw. I've got a drawing in my, my cabin right now that she drew and put in my suitcase, unbeknownst to me. Got it on the dresser. Good stuff. My son loves to construct, like, Legos. Loves Legos. Or Play-Doh. Or he, he's right now obsessed with paper airplanes. Dude is obsessed. He's, like, getting books from the library saying, how can I make different ones? You know, it's, it's, he just loves this stuff. Right? So he loves doing that there. One time in my life, one time, uh, I created, again, put it in quotes, a song for my then fiance, Rachel. It was my senior year of college. Uh, I played some guitar, so I wrote some lyrics, put a tune to it, and we went on a date, you know, found a quiet spot, and I played her this song, and that's the one time that'll ever happen. Um, yeah, she was really, really gracious. Anyway, so some of you are better at that than me. But here's the thing, with all of those examples, we are creating with 
already existing components. That's the difference. This is why we say God is creator. Jesus is creator. That should bring us to a point of awe to recognize you can't do that. You can't fabricate that, that he is creator over all things. That should serve to work humility in our lives. That should serve to work humility in our lives in terms of seeing that glory of Christ. Next, he's the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. Verse 3 says this. This is amazing. He is the radiance of the glory of God. If you want to know the glory and the moral beauty of God the Father, read scripture. L- look here. Get in here. Don't try to have a, have a dream or a vision. Get in the book. <laughs> See glory here. And recognize that he's showing and displaying Christ who is the radiance or the, the outstreaming or outpouring of the glory of God. All the glory came to the Father is contained in the Son. Such that when Jesus in John 14 addresses his disciples, he says, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. There's that kind of glory contained in Jesus. That's who he is. Contrary to the opinions of many in our culture, our various cultures around the world, Jesus is not some kind of quasi-hippie teacher, some kind of wandering vagrant who's saying some wise things. That is not who he is. He's not a legend. He's not some person with delusions of messiahship. He is God. And he is displaying the glory of God in full in his person. That's who he is. He is worthy here of your worship. I I love, man, more of this. I I love singing and worshiping God in that kind of way. And I just love saying to God, you're worthy of all glory and honor and praise. Because it's you, you're worthy of these things. Because he is the radiance of God's glory. He's also next, uh, he upholds all things by the word of his power in verse 3. Jesus is creator and sustainer. He doesn't just create, he also sustains us. This is, this is something to ponder, brothers and sisters. This is something to ponder here on this. Every day, Jesus is infinitely powerful. Every day, every moment. He is speaking all of the Milky Way and all other galaxies into being, as well as the molecules and the materials of this building. He's holding our flesh and our hair and our skin and lungs and tissue and fingernails into being, such that if he were to stop willing you into existence, you would cease to be. That's the kind of dependence you have on Jesus. He is the sustainer of all things. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's who he is. Glorious. Glorious. This is why we say, like John 15, 5, Jesus tells us, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Because that is true. When I brought home my, my firstborn child, Hannah, she's nine now. I was the youngest kid in my family, so I was never around babies too much. So when we brought her home, I was, I was amazed because I wasn't around kids very much. And, and I was just like, man, they don't, they don't do a whole lot, do they, Rachel? <laughs> and she's like, not for a while, Jeremy. I'm like, oh, like, when do they talk? When do they move and do stuff? And so I was totally just ignorant of all those things. And uh, just Hannah and Jonathan, like, as babies, utter dependence on their parents for everything. This is you. This is me. We are utterly dependent on God. We show that in prayer. To the degree that we neglect prayer is the degree to which we think we are self-sustaining. And let's just get a clue for all of us here. We are not self-sustaining. God sustains us. He gives us life and breath and everything. 
Next, he made purification for sins in verse 4. He made purification for sins. Jesus' atoning sacrifice is sufficient, guys. His atoning work is sufficient. It accomplished all that he set out to do. Salvation was purchased for us as sinners by his work. A perfect lamb was sacrificed on the cross. The wrath of God is poured out on Christ. He who knew no sin became sin so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. That's true. He finished that work decisively. He made purification for sin such that we go out and share the gospel with confidence. Knowing the work is done and the spirit is alive and at work in the hearts of people. And we share this gospel and pray God Keep doing your work. Thank you for Jesus' purification for our sins. We still sin. We still fall short of God's glory. And we still don't see this as we ought to and love him as we ought to. And so we need to pray for open eyes. Continually to see the glories of the gospel. And then to pray, God, I'm not who I was, I have a new identity, I have the spirit of God within me, I want to walk in freedom and walk in righteousness and you can empower me to do this. Gazing at the glory of Christ's purifying work has a purifying effect on our lives. He sat down in majesty, next one as well, Jesus sat down in majesty, I'll be brief here on this, he's king of kings. He'll exercise that in full someday when he returns. He is the king of kings. He, he's a sovereign God. He's a big God. He is sovereign and reigns over all government. It's important to say in this season of life, read Romans 13. He is sovereign and reigns over these things. He reigns over the devil. He reigns over weather. He reigns over heart attacks and cancer and Parkinson's disease. And there is mystery bound up in this to know what, how does this all mesh? How does this fallenness and sickness and suffering couple with God's goodness and God's sovereignty? And there's mystery to this. There's pain in this. And there are passages we read again and again. I don't know about you, but I read, I read Job on a regular basis. I read Psalms on a regular basis. I read those passages that show me people walking through pain in the midst of sorrows and trusting in God's sovereign hand. We can trust him. And oh, the stories I could tell. Oh, the stories you could tell. In this room of learning to trust God in the lowest points of life, we can one last one here, and then I want to make some points, finish this up. He's superior to angels in verse 4, which may seem odd, but in chapter 1 of Hebrews, it's a very important point that he's raising here, the author is. Angels often appear as impressive figures in the Bible. People see angels, they either bow down or faint or something like that. They tremble with fear. Jesus is superior to angels. He's God's son. He's actually worthy of the worship of angels in verse 6 of this chapter. And the Father has anointed him for an everlasting kingdom. In chapter 1, verses 8 to 13. So he's superior to angels. Now, let me say this for just a couple minutes before we go. All of this, Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. We've got an inerrant, infallible, inspired, authoritative word from the Lord in Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. This is true. This is true. Therefore, we must look to Jesus daily, hourly, whatever it is. Hebrews 2 verse 1 says we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard about Jesus. Chapter 3 verse 1 says consider Jesus. And chapter 12 verses 1 to 3 says look to Jesus and again consider him. Hebrews has this thematic idea of looking to Jesus. In 2, 1, 3, 1, and 12, 1 to 3. Those commands, look to Jesus, are like saying this, uh, Listen to your favorite song again. Or watch your favorite movie again. This is not an onerous command. We say, look to Jesus like, oh, 
obligation, duty, I've got to do this. If Jesus is the supreme treasure, and as great as this text says he is, there is joy in looking to him. This is a beautiful call on our lives. Jesus is infinitely better than any song or movie you can name or anything else in life. The call is to continually and constantly look to him, pay close attention to him, consider him, and we do this by being in his word. Luke 24 tells us Old and New Testament is about Jesus. It points forward to him. We need to be a Psalm 1 people that meditate on God's word day and night. And here's why. Let's close with this. Here's why. Beholding the glory of Christ, with all those things we just mentioned before as well, beholding the glory of Christ progressively frees you from the bondage of sin for the sacrifices of love. Beholding Christ ongoingly in your life frees you from the bondage of sin for the sacrifices of love. It's what it does. It makes a sacrificial people who say, I will go to the ends of the earth. I'll get prepared at places like this, and I will go to the peoples of the ends of the earth that have no gospel access, and I will, if needs be, lay down my life because I am completely satisfied in him. And that satisfaction frees me from the bondage of sin to go and lay down my life in love for others. This is why you need to see Jesus clearly. This is what he's calling us to. So whether you struggle with anxiety or pride or misplaced shame, impatience, covetousness, bitterness, despondency, or lust, the answer is looking to Jesus and seeing him and letting that glory continue to shape you and mold you into something new and something refined. Faith in God and His grace embraced in this kind of way will progressively renew your mind, free you from the clutches of sin, and help you find right character, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbors yourself, and be a catalyst in the lives of others to see Christ and savor Him. So, spend your life's energies, your capacities, seeing and savoring and spreading a passion for Jesus Christ because that will result in persevering assurance and joy and obedience in your life and the lives of a multitude of others. Father, I pray as we consider your son that we would see your glory displayed and that it would kill sin in our lives and we know personally what those sins are within us besetting sins that we want to get out of the way. Do that by gazing at your Son and the empowering of your Spirit. Free us to live lives of love to the glory of your name. Use this student body to impact millions of people for your name's sake. I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Dr. Kimball. Man, what an amazing list. What an amazing list. And I was really challenged by especially that reference to chapter 2, verse 1, where it says, for this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. And I don't know about you guys, but I often find myself drifting away from looking to Christ. And I get my eyes on myself. That's probably my biggest challenge. And I get my eyes on other people. And uh, this has been a really fantastic reminder, friends, about getting our eyes where they need to be on our Savior, the one who is our righteousness, our wisdom. Uh, so thank you for that really good reminder. Don't drift away from that. And if you've gotten your eyes off onto yourself or others, um, this is just a call to get your eyes back on the Lord. And you've got to have the, your eyes there to be able to, to run with perseverance the race that God has called every one of you to. So thank you. And let's take that one to heart. So we are going to be dismissed and uh, take these thoughts with you. And uh, may the Lord help us to put it into practice. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. So have a good day. We are dismissed.